Yeah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Okay, I'm going to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's word. John 17, beginning at verse 1, says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came from you. And they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. This is the word of the Lord. Let's ask the Lord for a special blessing. Father, we do come before you on this Lord's day, eternally grateful and thankful, Father, for everything that we possess in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the great salvation that he's given us. Father, open our mouths, Lord, that praises may come out. Turn our sighs into singing, Lord. And Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear from your word. I pray that your spirit would be with me in this pulpit and that he would be our teacher. Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach. And I ask you that you forgive me my imperfections, God, in this most holy task. And most of all, Father, I thank you for him in whose name I come. And would somebody with a loud voice say, Amen. Yeah. My sermon title this morning is Church Unique, Unoriginal Sin. Church Unique, Unoriginal Sin. And specifically what I'm going to be preaching this morning is that you and I have to be distinctively similar, okay? Distinctively similar. And as always, I'm very happy to be preaching the word to you this morning. And as you know, we're, we're currently taking a, a, a short break from the book of Romans. And we are doing a summer sermon series where uh, we are preaching what we call recast. So when we first came to, to Linwood, uh, we casted vision to our original core team. And what that meant was that we, we showed our church what we want to be and where we want to go, how we're going to get there, how do we know when we've gotten there, what's the method we're going to use to get there, and things of that nature, right? And now we're just going to recast that vision again to the whole congregation this time to make sure that it's in our minds and more importantly nestled in our hearts. Last week, Pastor Rudy preached on the idea that we are going to be a missional church, which has the idea that we are a church that looks for the good of our city in which we are in, that we are sent by God here. And now that we are here, we need to seek the redemption and restoration of this city, both spiritually and physically. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the idea that we have to be a unique church. We cannot commit unoriginal sin, we must be authentically unique. Now, that is not to say that we throw away all the traditions of church history. No, we still embrace and teach the old truths, but we need to be a fresh expression of that old religion. 
This is why I say we need to be distinctively similar. To be distinctive means to be unique, and to be similar means to be like. Let me give you an illustration from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Joshua was the disciple of Moses. And when the torch was passed from Moses onto Joshua, God said a very, very important statement to Joshua. He said to him, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Now, that is a very, very, very profound truth right there. That's some, that's some shouting stuff right there. Because God did some amazing things with Moses. I, I think in particular of the, the parting of the Red Sea. This was an especially jaw-dropping miracle that, that Moses performed. And it came at a very, very pivotal point in his ministry. See, at this point, his congregation, the Israelites, weren't too happy with him. They were pretty pissed off with him, okay? Now, the reason was that Moses had called out the children of Israel from Egypt out to the promised land. He took them from the familiar out into the unfamiliar. Okay, now, anytime you do that, like Rudy and I did that, calling you out of the familiar, some of you, Emmanuel, into the unfamiliar, Linwood, and things start to go bad, people be, be, start to become disillusioned and unhappy, right? But Moses, all he did was pick up his staff and he fixed that problem right away. And now sometimes I wish I could be like Moses and just pick up my staff and fix all our problems, but it doesn't always work that way. And yet God says, just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. And yet Joshua never struck a rock and had water come out of it. Joshua did part the Jordan River at one point in time in a similar fashion to the way Moses parted the, the Red Sea but it was still very distinct, right? You see, God told Joshua to gather up the elders of Israel and to carry the ark across the Jordan River, okay? And what happened next is he said, when they walk up to the edge of the river, God said that he would part the Jordan so that before all the eyes of Israel, everyone would see that just as God was with Moses, so was he with Joshua. But here's the thing, Joshua didn't just pick up his staff and split the river, no. Instead, they, they had the ark, they walked up to the river's edge, they began walking in, and nothing was happening. So they continue walking, at this point they're probably now waist deep in water, and nothing is happening. And at this point Joshua must have been sweating, like, Lord, don't make me look like a fool here, okay? But then as they begin walking, the water slowly began to recede. And sometimes God will do the miracle in people's lives before they do anything. And other times God will wait until you're up to your neck in water and you're crying out, God, when are you going to show up? And that's when he steps in. Just because God is with you, in the same way that he is with others, does not mean that you are those other people. You have to discover your own uniqueness or else you're gonna pick up your staff and it won't work. You might say, well, so-and-so fasted for three days and three nights and he got his miracle and then you try the same thing and you don't get it. God will be with you to the same degree that he is with others while still creating a unique experience with you. If God wanted Moses, he would have kept Moses, right? If God wanted John Calvin, he would have kept John Calvin, right? But no, he doesn't have Charles Spurgeon or, or John Piper here in Linwood. He's got me and you here because we're the perfect candidates for here. If they were the perfect candidates, they would be here. But God has you here. You're the perfect candidate. And God is committed to us in the same way. And you are going to be a fresh expression of an old truth. We won't be copycats. We're going to be who God created us to be. Look to your neighbor and say, be who God created you to be. When we try to do the work of others, 
we end up carrying weights and burdens and crosses that don't belong to us. We end up victimizing ourselves. We need to fulfill God's unique plan in our lives. Now, Jesus fulfilled the Father's unique work in his life. And in the same fashion, we need to do the same. We acknowledge that there is a general uh, will of God that we all have to fulfill, right? But then we also have to acknowledge that we all have a distinct and unique role in that will. The Father gave Jesus authority over all flesh so that he might give eternal life to all that the Father gave him, that is the elect. He brought glory to the Father by accomplishing this work. We find Jesus here not praying for everyone, but for the ones that the Father gave him. He was focused on his mission and nothing else. John 4.34 says, My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 15.10 says, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. John 19.30 says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he, gave, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What was finished? The work that the Father sent him to accomplish. Jesus fulfilled to the last detail everything that the Father commanded him to do. Now, Jesus' work was unique. No one else is called to die for the sins of the world. But we also have a unique calling in the midst of our general calling. So let me get this general calling out of the way first. Let me define what I mean by that. The general calling is God's will revealed for every single Christian, no matter what color you are, what size you are, where you live, what area you've lived in. This is for Christians everywhere, okay? And this is God's revealed will in the Bible, okay? The Word of God. And it's very simple. It's to know God's Word, to keep His commands in the Word, and to be a witness for Jesus and His Word, okay? That is God's will for your life, generally speaking, okay? For every single person. You don't need to put out a fleece to see if that's God's will for your life. You don't need to pray and ask God if that's His will for your life. No, it's His will for your life. It's in the Bible, okay? So we don't need to go through other measures to try and find God's will. Like, I know some people like to grab their Bible and they say, Lord, if you want to say something to me, and when I open my Bible, the first verse I point to, that's going to be your will. And they open it and they point to it and it's like, that's God's will for me, right? Somebody once did that. They, they said, God, speak to me. Tell me what you want me to do. They opened up their Bible. They pointed at a verse and it said, and Judas went and hung himself. And then they flipped the page and they said, no, Lord, tell me something else. And it said, now go, do, now go and do likewise. <laughs> then they flipped the page again and it said, what you do, go and do it quickly. So that person said, I'm not going to do that anymore. So we have a general calling, but every Christian still has a unique role, okay? For example, we are uniquely called to Linwood, okay? So it is imperative that we understand LA culture, South Central culture, uh, Linwood culture, Hispanic culture, because it's 90% Hispanic, uh, Roman Catholic doctrine, right? Because most of them are Roman Catholic. So if we're gonna reach a people group, we have to understand the culture. Now, what is culture? I'm gonna give you three definitions. First, a simple one. Culture is the unspoken rules of how things get done. Let me elaborate a bit more on that. Culture is the combined effect of the interaction of the values, thoughts, attitudes, and actions that define the life of your community. Let me give you a more extensive one. Culture is the intermingling of knowledge, beliefs, values, assumptions, Symbols, traditions, habits, relationships, rewards, language, morals, rules, and laws that provide meaning and identity to a group of people. Think of it this way. If you wanted to say, what is gang culture? Okay, you say, well, we could say, well, how do they dress? Well, in gang culture, they wear, you know, flannels, they button them up to here. 
Um, you know, they wear Nike Cortez, they wear baggy pants. Okay, that's one aspect of gang culture. Uh, another aspect of gang culture is that they like to get tattoos of Aztecs. Um, another aspect is they like to drive uh, low riders. Uh, another uh, culture of, of gangs is that there's violence. See, that's gang culture right there, okay? If you thought of a Southern California culture, you know, people like to go to the beach, people like to try different foods and post it on Yelp, that's Southern California culture. Mexican culture, there's certain things that define us as Mexicans, right? And it's our culture, it's the foods we eat, tacos, it's the music we listen to, um, different things, it's the way we discipline our kids. I, I remember seeing a t-shirt one time that had a sandal on it, and it said, I survived the chancla. And now every Hispanic knows that because for some reason, Mexican mothers like throwing shoes at their kids when they're in trouble. So that is culture. And so we have to ask ourselves, what kind of culture does RCLA have? What do we value? What are we, try to, what are we trying to do? What is the language we use? Different things like that. We need to ask ourselves questions like, what unique gifts do the leaders of this church have? What unique gifts do the people of, of the church have? What, um, what kind of shared heritage do we have? What values drive the decision making of our church? And what makes our church unique from all the other churches out there? These are things we have to ask ourselves. We have to discover our culture. We're a brand new church. We don't have a culture yet. But we're trying to develop that. Now, I told you that I titled this sermon, Unoriginal Sin. Okay? Now, what is that? Okay, this is unoriginal sin. Unoriginal sin is the common habit of neglecting what makes us as individuals and as a church as a whole, unique. And instead, gravitating toward adopting mindsets and programs that work somewhere else. Okay, it's being a copycat. It's saying, okay, I like the way this preacher preaches, I'm just gonna copy him. I like the way this worship team worships, I'm just gonna copy them. Um, we need a discipleship model, let's just copy and paste one from another church. Okay, that is, those are mistakes we make. Now, I want to give you six specific common mistakes that churches make that cause them to fall into the trap of unoriginal sin. The first one is what I'm going to call ministry treadmill, okay? Ministry treadmill. That's when you're just moving from one thing to another without thinking. Where everybody's just like, we got to do this, we got to do that, we got to get this done. And never sitting back and reflecting on what it is we're doing whether it's working, whether it's not working, whether what we're doing aligns with our values or doesn't align with our values, it's just mindless moving. Second, the competency trap. What this means is that when somebody is, uh, when a church is successful to a certain degree, right, they think that just because what got them there is gonna work forever. And they don't wanna hear nothing else, like no, this worked, we're gonna keep on doing it. Okay, that is a competency trap where you think that just because it worked once that it's gonna work forever and it doesn't work that way. The third, and this is an important one, this is what I'm gonna call the needs-based slippery slope. This is a reactive ministry. This is a ministry where we don't have any values, we don't have any culture. All of our decision-making is based on trying to make everybody happy, okay? So when you're looking to, to, to do a new service or, or how we're gonna arrange things or how we're gonna do stuff, we just say, well, let's ask everybody and whatever makes everybody happy, that's what we'll do, right? Problem with that is that you can't always make everybody happy. Four, the cultural whirlpool. This is, this is the idea that everything we do has to be the cutting edge, okay? When we wanna make a decision as to what we're gonna do, well, the decision is simple. The, the decision's already made, essentially. Whatever's the newest, that's what we're gonna do. The fifth mistake is what I'm gonna call the conference maze. This is when you go to conferences and they tell you how to run your church and you adopt their program from A to Z and then you go to another conference and then you, you adopt their program and you're just jumping from conference to conference to conference changing from program to program to program, and you never establish a culture in your church. And the sixth is what I'll call the denominational rut, okay? And what this means 
is that we just sit here and maintain the structures of yesteryear, right? Our denomination is the RCA, the Reformed Church in America. And there are many things that are great about it, but we can't stick to the ways that they've always been doing things because we live in a different time and a different period and we gotta do things differently. So here's my main point. You and I are prevented from following in one another's footsteps and are called to an incomparable association with Christ, okay? Now notice that I said prevented. What do I mean by that? If you are not fulfilling God's unique purpose for your life, God will do whatever it takes. He will move heaven and earth to make sure that he lets you know that you are not in his will. He will do certain things to grab your attention. God is committed to showing us how to follow the specific plan he has designed for each and every single one of our lives. When we begin to wander from that path God is calling us to, he has a variety of ways to grab our attention to draw us back. Now you might ask, like what? Let me give you four things that God does to get our attention. Number one, to get our attention, God may give you a restless spirit, okay? A restless spirit. Sometimes God gets our attention by giving us this restless spirit, and it can come in many ways and in different forms. You can't sleep. You have something weighing heavy on you that you can't figure out what it is. There's a wonderful illustration of this in the book of Esther. In Esther chapter six, verses one and two, I swear there's always an ambulance every time I'm preaching. <laughs> Esther chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, That night the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. So God gives this Persian king a restless spirit at night, right? And in God's providence, he asks for somebody to read to him the book of Chronicles so he could fall asleep. And what ends up happening there is that he discovers that Mordecai, who is the uncle of Esther, a Jew, was the one who exposed Bigthana and Teresh who were conspiring to assassinate him. And what ends up happening next is that the king exonerates and publicly honors Mordecai, okay? So God can give you a restless spirit to accomplish his purposes. I'll give you another illustration. You guys know who R.C. Sproul is? Yeah, He's a, he recently passed away last year, great theologian, Bible teacher. He says that when he was younger and he had gotten his first teaching job at the university where he graduated from, he said that he wanted to work there for the rest of his life. He said he loved that university, he loved every blade of grass, he loved every tree, everything. And he wanted to work there for the rest of his life, but unfortunately, they were only letting him work there for a year. Within a few months, another job opportunity came to him in Boston from another university, okay? And he was like, well, I don't wanna work there, I wanna work here, but I mean, God, I mean, that's the door you're opening, well, then I'll go there. And then a week later, the university where he was at offered him a full-time position. And he was like, well, hallelujah, glory to God. I'm just going to stay here now. This was my dream. I, I want to be here for the rest of my life. And then his friend told him, you know what, RC? I think you need to hold on for a minute. I think you need to ask God's guidance and counsel on this. So he did. And he said, okay, God. By tonight, I need you to tell me if you want me to go to Boston. If not, I'm gonna stay right here. And so they waited that night, and it was midnight, and he said, well, if God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, wanted to let me know that I needed to go to Boston, he would have told me already. So he, him and his wife went to bed super happy that night and said, I'm gonna be able to stay at the school that I want to be at. At three o'clock in the morning, a phone rings and he picks up the phone and it's a dude, I forget his name, but it's an individual 
that he grew up on the same block with when he was kids. He says that this, this individual was four years older than him, and so he never really hung out with him. He just knew that he was a kid up the street, and his mom, their, their moms were friends. He didn't know this individual. When he moved out of his block and he went to college, never heard of him, never saw him again, wasn't his friend, wasn't nobody. So when he called him at three in the morning, he's like, hey, is everything okay? He thought maybe that something had happened to his mom and they were trying to reach him, so he, they reached out to that individual and then he reached out to RC, but that wasn't the case. Instead, what he says, he says, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pilot now, and I'm, you know, he was grounded at the moment, and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I haven't been able to sleep, and I haven't been able to get something off my chest. He says, you can call the doctors if you want, you can call whoever you want, the loony bin, whatever, but I feel like I have to tell you this, and until I do, I can't get rid of this restless spirit. And he says, well, tell me. He says, I don't know why, but I, something just keeps telling me that I needed to call you and tell you that you need to take the job in Boston. And he was like, what? He says, yeah, I don't know why. He said, I just know that I feel this way and I called every operator because I didn't know where, where you worked, what university you worked at. Every single operator in Pennsylvania was calling every university to see if there was a professor, R.C. Sproul. I finally got a hold of you. You can call the loony bin if you want, call the doctor, but I just had to tell you that. Sometimes God can give people a restless spirit to get his message across to you. If you experience a deep and profound restlessness within yourself and you can't figure out why, just stop and ask God, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? Now, I'm almost hesitant to tell you this because I don't believe this is the normal way God works, right? I believe normally speaking, you got to read your Bible and God will tell you what he needed to do. But it does happen. I remember one time I was sitting in front of my desk, true story, I was sitting in front of my desk and I was praying to God and I was frustrated, like pulling your hair frustrated, wanting to know if God wanted me to do something. I won't say what it is because it's private, but I remember I was frustrated. I was so frustrated that when I was done praying, I don't know why I said this, but I said, I said, God, if you want me to do it, just give me a 10-4. I don't know why I said that, but I just said that. And I got so frustrated and I, I hit my keyboard. And when I hit my keyboard, I typed something in the Google thing. It was gibberish. But whenever you type something in Google, Usually some, an image pops up on the right. And so an image popped up and it grabbed my attention because of what it said. So I clicked on Google Images and all the images were the same thing. It said, okay, 10-4. Two, God can get your attention by giving you a spoken word. So God can grab our attention by, by way of the word of other people who are close to you and are known for giving sound biblical godly advice. He will bypass speaking to you in order to speak to you through somebody else to let us know that we need one another. There's a, there's a great illustration of this in the book of 1 Samuel. You can turn there if you like. 1 Samuel is in between the book of Ruth and 2 Samuel in the Old Testament. It's second, I mean, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 3, Verses 4 through 18, and it says, And the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So when he went and lay down, the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for a third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both 
ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day, I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be atoned for by sacrifice for offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. He said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. And what we see there is that God uses Eli first to speak to Samuel, and then he uses Samuel to speak to Eli. He could have spoken to either one of them directly after all, right? But he didn't. He bypassed that, and he used the word of somebody else to speak something into their life. If several people in a short span of time begin telling you the same thing, then just simply ask, Lord, are you trying to tell me something through them? Number three, unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayer. Sometimes God will not answer our prayers or just say no to all of them for a long period of time to let us know that he needs to get our attention. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now you may not be keeping wickedness in your heart, maybe you are. But you may be walking away from the path that God has called you and that is sin nonetheless. If you see this happening to you, God, just say, Lord, am I being obedient to your call on my life? Number four, God can get our attention through disappointment, defeat, and destruction. In the book of Numbers, we read that the children of Israel were commanded to take possession of the land of Israel. Of, excuse me, well, yeah, the land of Israel, the promised land at that time. And they refused because they didn't trust God. And then later on, they repented and said, never mind, God, we do want to take it. And God said, no, nope, it's too late. And they didn't ever possess the promised land. It wasn't until the next generation that they possessed the promised land. Only, you know that out of all the people that came out of Egypt in the Exodus and wandered around in the wilderness, there was approximately 600,000 of them. Do you know that only two of them made it into the promised land? Only two, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them were all the kids of their kids, their sons, their grandsons. It was the next generations. This must have been a huge disappointment for them. But the good thing is God got their attention. In the book of Joshua, we see how Israel was defeated in battle when they refused to follow the Lord's instructions. In the book of Judges, we see how the land of Israel was destroyed and taken over and their resources taken from other countries when they wouldn't obey God and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. In the book of Chronicles, we see kings falling ill when they stopped honoring God and became prideful. God always knows exactly where you are in your journey of faith and precisely what it will take to get your attention. So stay alert, take notice, and if any of these divine methods are occurring or reoccurring in your life, just stop and ask God, Lord, am I in your will or not? Are you trying to tell me something? Now you might ask me, well, how do I know God's unique will for my life? That is not an easy question to answer, but I'm gonna give you seven words to help you find God's unique will for your life. We have many decisions to make and we wanna make sure we make the right choices. We need God's guidance. The first word is discernment, okay? Discernment. One of the reasons why we fail to know God's will for our lives is that we do not have a discerning spirit. Now, what is discernment and how is it developed? Discernment, in layman's terms, is the ability to know the difference between right and wrong, okay? And Charles Spurgeon took it a step further and said this, discernment, is not only knowing the difference between right and wrong, 
It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. We develop this by studying the scriptures. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Lord instructs Israel to keep his word not in between bonded leather, but in their heart, and to teach it to their children. Because discernment takes time to develop, and we need to be teaching this to our kids from a young age. Do you have regular devotions with your kids? Do you have a scripture memorization plan for yourself? If you develop this, you will have little trouble knowing God's will in each situation. Second word, cleansing. We need to daily ask God if anything in our lives is hindering God's will for us. Now, how do you, how do you obtain cleansing? Simple. Cleansing comes through confession. Okay? 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Third word, surrender. We need to humble ourselves and obey God's every command even when we don't understand it. We always want to know step two before we take step one. Okay, God, I'll do what you're telling me to do, but I need to know what's going to be the outcome. No. We need to step out in faith, obeying in humility, knowing that in God's perfect timing, he will lift us up. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up. The fourth word, ask. That's very simple. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. Very simple. Five, meditate. Now, I'm not talking about meditate in the weird way like the, like the Eastern religions. I'm talking about meditating on God's word. The Puritans, the English Puritans were very, very good at this. When they would listen to sermons, they would take notes and they would go back home and they would meditate on those notes for an hour or two. Because that's how you get stuff into your heart, right? Because that's where you want it. The Puritans used to say that one hour of meditating is better than a thousand sermons. We need to start meditating on God's word. Six, believe. Can't receive without believing. Simple. And number seven, everyone's favorite, wait. You have to wait on God to reveal his will to you. He doesn't work on your timing. He works on his own. God is committed to making sure you know and understand his perfect will for your life. You were not born by accident. You have a special destiny. You have to figure out what that is. Don't be a copycat. Don't do anyone else's work. By being yourself, you will leave something wonderful in this world that wasn't there before. And may God help us to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you, Lord, and thank you for your word, which promises to never return void, but it, that it will accomplish what it intended to accomplish. And Father, I pray that every heart would be uh, penetrated and that the seeds that were placed in the hearts would germinate and bear much fruit. Father, if somebody needs conviction, I pray that you would convict them. If somebody needs comforting, I pray that you would comfort them. But whatever, would every single person here walk out with something? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.